Yes! I think I did it. Are you guys ready? Oh, yeah, here we go. Yeah, that was. <laughs> well, okay. We're so safe. Let's pray. <laughs> let's, let's pray. Uh, Father God, what a joy it is today. Lord, this is a day that you have made. God, I'm here just so glad to gather here to hear from you, Lord, to, to get into your word. Father, I pray that uh, your spirit would move in this place today, that we would, we would hear from you and we would learn what it means to imitate you, our Father. God, we love you. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 All right, guys. So as a class, we have been preaching through the book of Ephesians. Um, you see, Ephesians follows this pattern that, that Paul does in a lot of his letters, where the beginning half of the letter is all about uh, knowledge. It's all about what Christ has done, and he's informing us of that. And then the latter half is all about what we are to do in light of that. So today, we're going to start here in Ephesians 5. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start reading. When I hit something that I feel is, is profound, I'm going to stop and explain it. I'm going to stop and explain it, okay? Ephesians 5, verse 1 says, Therefore, all right, I'm going to stop and explain it. Okay, so whenever, whenever you come to a therefore in the Bible, you have to pause and look back so you can find out what the therefore is there for. Okay, so Ephesians chapters 1, 2, and 3 are all about what Christ has done for us. We've preached through these three books together, and we've seen how uh, through Jesus we are adopted, we are accepted, we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. We've seen God's grace and his wisdom through our salvation. We've seen how through Christ we have an inheritance. We have received the Holy Spirit, which seals our inheritance. And we have pondered the riches of knowing Christ. We've looked at how the person of Jesus is the perfect uh, incarnation of the will of God here on earth. So that's chapters 1, 2, and 3. And then we started getting into chapter 4, and there's a shift that takes place in chapter 4. Uh, the shift is very, very important, um, because it shifts from what Christ has done to what we as believers in Christ are supposed to do in light of that. And this shift is very important, because Paul begins to get very practical in, in his commands to us. And I'm going to make this statement, and I want you guys to hear me out when I say this. Apart from salvation, the most important thing about a believer is the way that they follow God. It's the way that they walk throughout their life. Apart from salvation, the most important thing about a believer is the way they follow God. And that's why the latter, last three chapters of Ephesians are so important because they tell us practically how to imitate God. Let me ask you, what is the chief complaint that the world has about the church? They say the church is full of hypocrites. Because just like Paul, they can talk the talk in chapters 1, 2, and 3, but we always stumble when it comes to following it out. And that's why the last three chapters are so important. We get to chapter 4, and we see that uh, in light of what Christ has done, we are to walk in the fruits of the Spirit. In light of what Christ has done, we are to have unity with one another. In light of what Christ has done, we are to use the gift that he has given us through the apostles, the teachings of Christ. We are to put off the old self and put on the new. We are to speak truth to our neighbor in love. And then we come to chapter 5, and Paul gives us a command. He says, be imitators of God. And then he uh, illustrates how to do that. He gives us three manners of walking in chapter 5, of how we are to be imitators of God. He tells us to walk in love in verse 2. He tells us to walk in light in verse 8. And he tells us to walk in wisdom in verse 15. Today, we're going to focus on that first one, walk in love. 
So join with me in Ephesians chapter 5, as I start reading here at verse 1. It says, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. The word imitator that's used, that Paul uses here is a Greek word, mimetes, and it has this connotation of mimicry, it's where we get our word mime from. Um, it's used five other times in the New Testament, and every time it's used, it has to do with this connotation of following an example. Um, for example, um, Paul uses this same word, mimetes, in 1 Corinthians 4, 16, when he says, I urge you then be imitators of me. Or in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, when he says, follow me as I follow Christ. The importance of understanding this word, imitate, is that there's an underlying premise behind it. It's saying, imitate God, but what that means is that God has already given us the example of how to imitate him. It's this idea that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. And he is the perfect representation of who God is. The life that Jesus lived is exactly what we need to imitate as Christians. And that's what Paul's saying in these first words of Ephesians. Look at uh, Ephesians 5, rather. Um, look at the second clause of verse 1. It says, as beloved children. The point that Paul is making here is he's taking this command, be imitators of God, and he's making it intimate and personal by saying, as beloved children. This command to imitate God is intimate because you are a child of God. You see, every father looks for traces of themselves within their child. Now, I understand we probably don't understand that pretty well just because we're not fathers, but Pastor Don probably does. When a father looks upon their child, they're always looking for similarities between themselves and their kid. I can, I can tell that this is true. Um, and you probably can too as well, when you look at, uh, when people are observing children, I'll say, people are observing children, um, what's the one thing that they always point out to the parents, right? They're like, oh my goodness, they have your wife's eyes. Or, see that what he just did right there? That's, that was from you. They're always pointing out similarities from the children to the parents. And that's because for the parents, that results in joy. It's, it's a fulfilling kind of thing. I experienced this once. I mean, I'm not a father, uh, but I have nieces and nephews. Um, and I brought my niece, Kira, to a Zach Williams concert one time. And we're up in the balcony, and uh, there's this whole stadium of people. They all have their hands raised in worship, and I was worshiping God. Uh, my niece gets my attention. She, like, grabs on my leg. She's, like, seven or eight this time. And she's like, look, Uncle Josh. She had stacked the uh, popcorn boxes together. She goes, I stacked these up so I can raise my hands higher. So I remember just laughing so hard because she, I was, I was, she was mimicking what I was doing, and that resulted in joy for me. How do you think that God feels when he looks upon us? How overjoyed is God when, we, when he looks on us and he sees himself? Psalm 147.11 says, The Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him, in those who hope in his steadfast love. How overjoyed must God be when he looks upon you and he sees himself in the way that you walk? From this command of imitate God, uh, Paul gives the three ways or manners of walking, which are walk in love, walk in light, walk in wisdom. Like I said, we're going to focus on walk in love. We're really going to spend a lot of time dissecting what that means uh, and also what it doesn't mean. Um, so here, read with me um, verse 2. It says, walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrance offering and sacrifice to God. When Paul tells us to love in the manner that Christ has loved us, it is not a new commandment. Actually, Jesus gave us this commandment in John 13, 34, when he said, A new commandment I give to you, that you should love one another, just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. And my favorite description of the love of God comes from 1 John 4, where it says, In this 
the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. If you were to Google what the most common Bible verse to memorize is, I'm sure you could even guess it. It's John 3.16. And the entire message of John 3.16 is, For God so loved that he gave. See, the love of God is trademarked by sacrifice. It's this sense of, of giving from what you have. And when it comes to loving others, it's this sense of, I'm willing to do without so that you can have. We're coming up on Christmas pretty soon. I remember when I was a child in Sunday school, um, arguing with my Sunday school teacher about everything. Huh. Um, she, she had talked about how Christmas was Jesus' birthday. And how, I was like, why is it that we get gifts on Jesus' birthday? Why don't you give Jesus a gift? And I'm like, joke's on you, he's in heaven, I can't do that. You know? <laughs> and also, also, it's not like he wants my scooter anyway. In your face, Miss Karen. Anyway, she was like, let me tell you, Josh, the number one thing that Jesus wants for his birthday is for you to give him your bad habits. Ooh. Um, I remember her saying that, and I was like, what do you mean, like chewing my fingernails? Like, <laughs> I didn't understand it, because I was only like five or six at the time, but I was, I was a very controversial child. Apart from that, the point is, is that to love God and to love others is to love sacrificially. And then, Paul makes a stark shift. He changes from the love of God, and he starts describing in detail what I feel is the love of the world. Let me explain. In the next few verses, he's going to highlight three sins. He's going to highlight sexual immorality, he's going to highlight covetousness, and he's going to highlight filthy speaking. What I want us to understand is that these three are manifestations of the love of the world, or love of self. So if you read with me, starting in verse 3. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you, as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is, an idolater, we're going to talk about that, don't worry, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them. We're actually we're going to work backwards. We're going to start with filthy talk. Um, the first manifestation of the love of the world is filthy talk. Um, filthy talk can really be described as anything from grumbling to cursing. Grumbling, complaining, gossip, lying. Using cuss words is filthy and foolish talk. Matthew 12, 36 says, I tell you on the day of judgment, Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees, people will give an account for every careless word that they speak. The NIV says every empty word. Likewise, Jesus is speaking in Matthew 5. He says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Whatever is more than these is of the evil one. The text in Ephesians highlights crude joking. Um, crude jo joking really is a form of self-love because what you're doing is you're tearing down another individual in order to build yourself or others up. Brothers, we have not learned Christ in this way. Let there never be a hint of filthy or foolish talk within us. A second form of, or a second manifestation of worldly love that Paul highlights is covetousness, which is idolatry. Uh, Paul actually 
highlights covetousness as idolatry multiple times across his letters. Um, 1 Corinthians 5, Colossians 3, Galatians 5. Um, if we had time, I would dive into those passages as well and, and highlight how covetousness is idolatry, but for the time being, we're not going to do that. Um, instead, I'm just going to define it for you. Covetousness or greed is having a strong desire for material possessions. And idolatry is when we trade the position of Almighty God in our heart for something else. And in the sense of covetousness, it's, it's a material possession. Do you want to know how to tell if you have covetousness in your life? Start, think of something in your life that brings you great joy. It can be really anything. Um, it can be your car. It can be, um, it can be your house. Um, something really simple for me, I, I play video games, so my gaming system brings me a lot of joy in life. Um, and then imagine that God asks you to give that up. Are you quick to argue with him? Like, wait a second, God, no, this thing brings me joy, it must be good, I need this in my life. Well, the Bible calls that idolatry. Mm. And brothers, we have not learn Christ in this way. Let there be no hint of covetousness within us. The third one that I'm going to talk about of the manifestations of the love of the world is sexual immorality. This is the first one that Paul lists in verse 3. Uh, you list it again in verse 5. There's a reason that Paul listed it first, and there's also a reason I'm, I'm listing it last. I'm listing it last so I can finish on it. Um, but Paul listed it first because he's right, think about it, he's writing to the, uh, the church of Ephesus, right? You can imagine Ephesus as the Las Vegas of the ancient world. Their culture was sex. You went, you worshipped through sex in Ephesus. Everything you did, it was everywhere. It was, it was pervasive and all over the place. And to, to not be involved in sexual activities was to be an outcast in Ephesus. Does that sound familiar? That's our world today. It's by, it's by no mistake that we're reading the letter to the Ephesians, and we see the similarities of their culture then to our culture now. This manifestation of self-love, sexual immorality, was listed first, not because it's worse than the other two, but because it does have a different kind of power on your life. So we're going to spend quite a bit of time talking about sexual immorality. Um, to define sexual immorality, I'll say it is any sexual action that takes place that is outside the God-defined moral sexual boundaries. Moral sexuality, on the other hand, is a physical, emotional, and spiritual action that takes place between a man and a woman that have been bound as one through marriage. Sex really is a gift that God has given us. And he gave it to us so that we can enjoy it. He wants sex to bring us great joy and blessing, but he also knows that it's a powerful gift. And when it is used incorrectly, it can cause great pain and sorrow. I think the best um, analogy that I ever heard describing sexuality, it came from Linnell Buchanan. Uh, I think it was a few weeks, maybe it was last week, she was talking in Intro to Counseling, and she was quoting another speaker, I can't remember the other speaker's name, but the analogy went like this. Um, a boy, who's, for his 10th birthday, his parents get him a dirt bike, right? And he's overjoyed, he's so excited. And his parents, they sit him down, and they explain to him, listen, we love you, and we give you this gift. And we want this gift to bring you so much joy and so much blessing into your life. But please understand that this gift is powerful. And because we love you, we're going to put restrictions on how you can use this gift. Using this gift incorrectly 
will result in pain and sorrow. So we're going to restrict how you can use the bike, we're going to restrict when you can use the bike, with who you can use the bike. The same is true of sex. How easy is it for us to look at our culture today and understand how perverse sexuality runs rampant and the consequences that come from that? The consequences of sexual morality are physical, emotional, and spiritual pain. We have to deal with things like rape and STDs. Uh, we have to deal with abuse in our culture. We have to deal with slavery. Do you realize that? Did you realize that slavery was abolished in 1865, and yet today, more people are enslaved around the world than ever before? And I'm not talking like a metaphorical like symbolism of our, our uh, slavery to sin. I'm talking about physical, real chains as people are passed around for profit and sex. And it's like we don't even try to hide our idolatry anymore. I think that the greatest manifestation of idolatry through sexual immorality is through abortion. We look at the Canaanites in the past, and we get choked up when we think about them sacrificing their children to the god of Molech. We call it an abomination. We call it disgusting. And yet, today, when thousands of children are sacrificed to the god of self, we call it a human right. The effects of idolatry through sexual immorality and covetousness are so great. That's why in Paul, that's why Paul says in verse 3 that it should never even be named among us. You see, idolatry that is in sexual morality and covetousness is so hideous to our God that not only are we commanded not to practice it, we are commanded to live so far above it that any accusation towards us will be counted as dog's vomit. Any act, anybody who would dare accuse us of, of living in this way would be counted as a fool. That is, that is our goal that we are striving for. But remember why, please remember why we strive for this goal. My hope and my prayer is that every day we would strive to walk in the love of God. <laughs> we would strive to, we would look back at Ephesians 5 and we would remember what the therefore is therefore. We would remember that the love of the world is from a position of selfish taking, but the love of God is from a position of selfless giving. I pray that every day we would look back, and not only would we commit to turning away from our old self, but that we would embrace the new. And we would do it because of Jesus. Remember, you were once dead in your trespasses and sins. But God, because of the great love that he had for you, raised you from death, and he made you alive in Christ. Brothers, let us walk in that every day. Let us walk in that sacrificial love. Let's pray. God, you are so good to us, and we can't even comprehend. I can never 
begin to comprehend the love that you had for me when you died. God, I can't even begin to comprehend the love you have for me. When you came and you took away my sin, you took the, sh the shackles away, God. Father, I can't even begin to comprehend the way that you look on me with grace and mercy when after you have taken the chains of sin off of me, I still return to them and sit with them. Father, I pray that your spirit would be so invasive in our hearts, God, that it would change the very way that we walk. Lord, I pray that every morning we'd wake up and we'd be eager to look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, God, and that we would be eager to walk in the same manner that he has, God. Father, be with us. Show us how to walk in love, the same love that you have had for us. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. You want to just step down and stop it? And then kneel in front of the... Uh